Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, September 28th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but I want to thank you guys and girls for being here, obviously. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions is getting kind of interesting in here. Your questions on trading, uh, if you don't mind, keep them uh, to what's on the slides while we're on the slides. And then once I finish up towards the end, feel free to ask questions in general. Your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, for your benefit, hold off until we get to the live charts for that. Also, just put in one ticker symbol and hit return, and that's, again, for your benefit at a time, that is. So you can ask about as many as you want. Just put in a symbol and hit return again. So what we talk about, well, I woke up this morning thinking, have you truly accepted your trading decisions? Moving from the planning your trade into the trading your plan thing. And it's kind of an interesting thing. We all go through this and we're never immune to a lot of these issues. So I thought now might be a good time to do that. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So, again, we come back to acceptance. And if you look up the definition to accept, I poked around a little bit and I found the one I liked on Merriam-Webster. And the number three one made the most sense to me. To endure without protest or reaction. And then to regard as proper, normal, or inevitable. And as you'll see in one second, and as I often preach, trading is making decisions and living with them. And it's the in living with them that's tough. And that goes for any decision, not just trading decisions, but in life. Phil says, so we have to endure this webinar. Yes, you do, Phil. <laughs> Jeez, I'm getting beat up by a friendly. Nah, I know Phil's just taking the piss out of me. He's over there in England. I think that's what they say. All right, so when it comes to acceptance, I made a list of a few things, and there's probably quite a few more. Usually when I start working on these things, I just can't stop. And at the last minute, I'm throwing in extra slides as I was just a few minutes ago. But first and foremost, and I think this probably sums it up, shit happens, right? And continuing along those lines, no one knows what will happen next. Garbage in, garbage out. I learned that from my programming days way back in the day. But unfortunately, outcomes are still noisy. Sometimes a good-looking trade can go wrong. We're going to explore all this further. Good times follow bad, and unfortunately, vice versa. There's a risk in every trade, and waking up this morning, for that matter. There is no eternal sunshine. All trades eventually end badly, even good ones. More often than not, markets will move against you, and you're going to be wrong a lot. But you can still make money. And there will be emotions and consequences. Fear is normal. Becoming petrified is a sign that something is wrong. And that's something that I've been doing a lot of research and work on lately. And a few of these slides I borrowed from a presentation, I think I did uh, three or four weeks ago, where I just covered fear in and of itself. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that you never become immune to these things. But I think the secret is, if there is a secret, is learning to recognize them and learning to recognize that uneasiness and doing the hard thing or resisting those temptations, as we'll see in one second, in spite of that. So the first and most obvious thing when it comes to trading is shit happens, okay? Now, me telling you this and it happening to you are two different things, but I think this is one thing that regardless of your methodology, regardless of how long you've been trading, provided you've been trading more than a couple days at least, or three weeks like the gentleman I mentioned in my last column, column four last, you've experienced some bad things. Now, I keep coming back to Mark Douglas, 
and I was reading a little trading in the zone, and it's probably had a big influence on today's presentation. I woke up and read a little bit of uh, his book, just kind of flipped through some highlighted things that I had in there. And I'm not sure where exactly he said this. I think he said this in a Tellerate tape going way back to the mid-90s. And he said, all it takes is one A-ho to screw up a perfectly good trade. And that's something that you got to wrap your head around and you got to live with. And as I often say, trading never gets easy, but it does get easier. And sometimes it helps as you learn more and more and more about markets and more and more about markets. Participants, life becomes a little easy. And I'll give you a case in point. I mean, I, what's the... Um, Michelangelo saying, I, I forget the uh, Encora Imperio, I think, which means I'm still learning. And he was 89 years old or something when he said that. And it's amazing. The longer I'm at this, the more I learn and learn and learn and learn. And the more I realize how stupid it was years ago. But before I digress too far, where I'm going with this is I was speaking at a conference last year in Vegas to a bunch of day traders. And usually, They'll say, yeah, we got a bunch of day traders, and I show up, and, and people are not day traders. They have full-time jobs, and they dabble in the market, and they're, they're nowhere near a day trader. But these guys were serious day traders and a bunch of gunslingers. And one thing that they did, which I didn't realize that people do, and it was a common strategy amongst them, and they, and they would over-leverage, sometimes triple leverage their accounts or more, or whatever is allowed day trading. Quadruple leverage? I forget. But just crazy leverage into shorting parabolics. In other words, stocks that go straight up. Well, one of my pattern, one of my patterns, the trend knockout, the TKO, which you can find under videos on my website. One of the beauties of it is that you can capture these parabolic moves. And that's because it sucks in the shorts and then spits them out. And then it also when the market's making those new highs right before you get the TKO move, the strong bar down, which sets up the setup, the pullback type of setup in nature, it also sucks in the Johnny come lately's and then spits them out. Well, when the market begins to go parabolic, if you're lucky enough or fortunate enough, I should say, if you did everything right and the stars align, well, these guys are out there fighting you, fighting your trade. And I didn't know that. So sometimes you get these parabolic moves, you're feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden, the stock begins to implode. Well, as I said in the presentation, kind of ad lib, it's like, well, now I know who the AHO is, and it's nice to meet you. So you will continue to learn this business. And even though you don't know everything, like I didn't really know that it was these shorts that were coming in and knocking me out of these perfectly good trades. But even though I didn't know, I could still do the right thing by honoring my stop. Yes, I still drop an F-bomb, but I was still able to honor my stop. Now, what's interesting is, is that sometimes the A-hole might not even be a trader. It could be an off-the-cuff remark by somebody in the Federal Reserve who could be completely out of touch, by the way. I listened to a forget her name, I wish I'd give her credit. I listened to a podcast recently, and she, this uh, lady used to work for the Fed, and she did a podcast with Charlie Wright. So you can Google Charlie Wright and Fed, and you probably can find it. And it was pretty scary that the Fed is out of touch, according to her podcast with him. In fact, I got about halfway through, and I couldn't listen to it anymore, and I told Charlie I had to turn it off. He's like, sorry you didn't like it. I'm like, no, I liked it. It's just scary that they're that out of touch. So before I digress too far, the point is that the a-hole might not even be a trader. And I think the most classic example of this is a Jody Fisher debacle with Hewlett Packard, the CEO of Hewlett Packard at the time. And ironically, I kind of wrote about something along these lines in layman's in a day that layman's literally went to the publisher or came back from the publisher, I forget. No, no, I'm sorry, went to the publisher. This debacle actually happened. Well, the CEO of Hewlett Packard had this lady, Jody Fisher, working for him. And Jody, in a prior life, 
had a, a bit of a adult film career. Now it's I think it's called soft porn, uh, which he which he did, but kind of these uh, B movie type of things. And he just figured that well, if she did that in her prior life, then maybe she'd continue to want to do these things with me. And anyway. I, I forget, it escapes me at the moment, but I forget how many billion dollars were lost overnight just by this impropriety from, uh, impropriety from a, a, a CEO. So it could be anyone. Now, I'm kind of beat the dead horse, harsh on this one. My brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say harsh for some reason. But if you've come to more than one of these presentations, one of my favorite things to say is no one knows exactly what will happen next. So don't beat yourself up if you don't know what's going to happen next. No one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. Now, I know I kind of beat the dead horse on this. But it's true. No one knows exactly what a market will do. Now, you might have somebody who spent a lot of their time studying markets and has a pretty good idea, but it's still an educated guess at best. Way back in my computer science days, I learned pretty quickly when I was spending late nights in the uh, room in front of a terminal, in front of the computer room, Garbage in, garbage out. One of the more senior programmers there mentioned that to me while I was struggling with the program. So the better your trade's going in, the better your chances of succeeding in the trade and the less psychological issues you will have. But unfortunately, it happens still, even on well-thought-out trades. Now, Terrence O. Dean said that markets generate a lot of data, but they don't generate a lot of clear feedback. Outcomes are noisy. Good decisions may have bad outcomes, and bad decisions may have good outcomes. And it's just human nature to have a tendency to take credit for our successes while blaming our failures on bad luck or others. Well, I just said that all it takes is one AHO. Well, yeah, you can blame him, but you have to accept that risk going into the trade, and you have to be willing to stop out. And you got to be really careful not to do the wrong thing, not to over leverage. I recommended a trade once, as I've said before, that worked out pretty damn good. And the it was for an institutional type of situation and a hedge fund manager came in and said well you picked up nickels in front of that bulldozer and he was right it, it it probably shouldn't have been taken even though it worked and i felt pretty smug about it it was not the right thing to do john hold off on stock picks so i can um get to, get to the other questions just wait till we get to the charts i'll be happy to get to to all of those so you got to be careful not to take credit for your success and not to blame others for your failures. And then you also, again, have to be careful that you don't allow a bad decision that has a good outcome. You got to be careful with that. If you do the wrong thing, as I often preach, and I don't want to beat the dead horse on this, but the market's a bad teacher. If you over leverage or if you're trading some sort of so-called income producing strategy where you're selling options or something, that'll work until it don't. So you'll, you'll end up with this false sense of confidence. Now I'm going to show you something that you've never seen getting back to garbage in garbage out. Sometimes it happens a losing trade. So here's a case where this stock looked pretty good. It was, it was an IPO and that's why I liked it. It began to break out nicely, and as if you've been coming to these presentations, you know, or the IPO presentations that I've done, you know that IPOs have a really nice breakout characteristic to them. And then even better, it had a deep pullback. Comes up, it just barely triggers, and then begins to implode. So there you go. There's a losing trade, something that a guru has never got in front of you 
than shown. So the point is that sometimes you could do everything right. The trend was accelerating. It was fairly persistent. You had a nice deep pullback. Pretty clean setup. IPO, hot IPO. But it didn't work. Now, when you look to a string of trades, sometimes good times will follow bad, and unfortunately vice versa. Bad times will follow good. Now, as I often say, I call it African Queen Syndrome. I hope the African Queen's still down there in Key West. I took this picture a few years back. I had to fly down and uh, get a picture for the presentation. I spare no expense for, for you guys and girls. This is the African Queen. If you've seen the movie, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here too, but they were trying to escape the Germans, and they went through all these trials and tribulations and insects and leeches and all these other things, and they were just trying to get down to the lake, and they'd be home free. They gave up. Well, the camera pans back, and they're like, less than 100 yards away from the lake, maybe even closer. They gave up right before they reached their destination. And there's been stories throughout history. What's the one 10 feet from gold? There was a, um, I forget exactly how the story goes, but some people got into the gold rush and they bought a bunch of, of equipment and they dug and dug and dug and dug and dug and it was supposed to be one of the greatest veins ever. They've done the research, but they didn't find any gold, and finally just gave up. They sold their equipment for pennies on the dollar, and then the people who came in and bought the equipment went 10 more feet, literally 10 more feet, and they found one of the largest gold veins in the history of the United States. So good times will follow bad. And this is one thing that pains me the most, and obviously it pains me when I'm going through and I'm going through a drawdown and get a little bummed out. Because, you know, I have a pulse, too. I'm not immune to all these feelings and emotions, etc. But one thing that really stresses me out and bums me out is when I see people quit a trend-following methodology like mine right before it finally hits the sweet spot. I had a client once, and he was in the trading service, and he quit. Actually, he just stopped trading it, but he, he continued to follow along. And he stopped looking at it for about a month after he quit. And then one day he got bored and pulled it up. And we had these huge winners in the portfolio. And he called me up and said, Dave, I feel like I broke up with my fiance. And then the following Saturday night, she hit the Powerball. You know? <laughs> because he missed all these huge winners because he simply gave up. Now, I realize the definition of the insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. But sometimes in trading, you almost have to be a little insane. If you have that methodology in place and you're doing the right thing, then it might take a little while, but eventually you're going to hit that sweet spot and make a lot of money. And one thing I was reading recently, and I fully agree, and I think it's something I've actually talked about quite a bit, is that... A bad plan, following a bad plan is better than not following a good plan. And hopefully I said that right. And if you think about it, in trading, all you have to do, I know easier said than done, all you have to do is just follow that plan, right? And even if it's not a great plan, if you followed a plan, you proved that you could do it, then you just go back and work on the plan in and of itself. And that can be done, obviously, after hours. And as I often preach, following the process is key. And following the process just being simply means following the plan. In fact, if you boil down trading psychology, and as I often say, it's making decisions and living with them. But it could also be seen as, it's cliche, but plan your trade and trade your plan. So here I am with about probably 100 books that I'm going through for this trading psychology I'm working on, plus hundreds and hundreds of slides that I've already presented, plus the entire trading psychology thing I did with trading full circle, which a lot of the slides today obviously come directly from that course. 
And I vacillate between, let's sum it up on one page, plan your trade, trade your plan, trading psychology, any questions, and going through all this massive amount of data. Well, you do have to understand why it's hard, and you do have to understand markets. And the more you understand markets and, and the more you understand the psychology from a psychological standpoint and from a physiological standpoint, the easier it becomes. But it never becomes easy, but the easier it will become. Now, on the flip side of good times following bad is vice versa, bad times follow good. And I see this all the time, especially when the market is, is doing incredibly well or has a longer term trend. And that could be an uptrend or a downtrend. But as I often preach, everything works better with trend. And I've seen people do some amazing things with some arcane type of methodologies. But what they fail to realize is that their methodology was dovetailing in with the trend. And something as simple as a moving average would have kept them in the same exact trend. Unfortunately, when that trend ends, they begin fighting it. But as I often say, pride goeth before the fall. Usually what will happen is they'll become very cocky and they feel like they've found the holy grail. And as I've said quite a bit, husband and wife team comes to mind, but there's, there's been more than one. But entrepreneurs that have joined my service in really, really good times where we're printing money on pullbacks, they're like, man, I get this. I'm going to quit my business that I worked many years to build. No, as Nicholas Fine would say. <laughs> no, you, you hit a good spot, okay? It won't always be this good. I'd make a lot more money in the education business if I made it sound like it was easy and was always great. But it's not. In fact, if I had to bet on a trader, I would bet on a trader that started doing crappy times and toughed it out as opposed to someone who came in and hit the sweet spot just right. And the reason is they're going to be a lot more tempered in their expectations. And when those good times come along, they'll say, man, it's good right now, but it won't always be this good. So I better make hay while the sun shines. And I better not leverage up and feel like God. And that's another thing that I see all the time, too, not to not to come back to the trading service. But in the trading service, when I'm doing really well and the market's doing really well, people see how easy it is. And I'm making air quotes. And they go off and they trade a bunch of pullbacks. And they think it will always be that way. And the same, the same thing happened with the IPO course. And I know it sounds a little braggadocious, but we've had this great bull market in IPOs. And I've lost clients off the trading service because they've got the IPO course. They started printing money in IPOs. And they're like, I got this. This is all I ever need to do. Well, they have an experience, a period of two to three or four or five years where it's going to be a lot harder to make money in those IPOs when there won't be as many of them coming public because conditions have deteriorated. And then there won't be the dichotomy between the good and the bad like we have right now. Now, getting back to the presentation, there is a risk in every trade. There's also a risk in waking up every day. But we get out of bed and we do it anyway, right? So, as I mentioned a few weeks back, trading involves risk. Well, there's duh implied. So, risk by definition means a potential to fail. So, why is it if you tell somebody that there is a risk in this trade, they'll look at you like you pooed your pants, kind of like you walk, they look at you like you walked into Starbucks and asked for a cup of coffee. I used to do that years ago until I finally was schooled on how I should order from my daughter. I told her what I wanted, and she explained to me how I order it. You know, and I could go in there and try to memorize it, so I don't look like an idiot. I don't get out much, as you can tell. <laughs> when I get out, I go somewhere across the world where they don't have a Starbucks. <laughs> so anyway, 
So you look, you tell somebody trading involves risk, and they look at you like you pooed your pants. But then once they take a trade, all of a sudden it's a big shocker. Let the dogs out. It's a big shocker when the trade begins to go against them. And as we'll see in one minute, more often than not, it will be going against you. Now, with risk, there's two types of risks. There's the monetary risk, and that's pretty damn obvious. You're going to risk some money. But with that risking of money comes a psychological risk. And as the late great Mark Douglas once said, when you lose on a trade, it's not necessarily that trade in and of itself, but it's every other losing trade that you ever had. <laughs> My dog trainer is in the house. Craig, shut the dog up. <laughs> He's deaf and blind. We're just waiting for him to die. Uh, was that an outside thought? <laughs> yeah, you come live with him for a week and let him in and out a hundred times a night. Usually after you like sit down and get the laptop all set up and, <laughs> and get all comfy, he needs to go out. Anyway, there's a psychological risk involved. And as Mark Douglas said, it's not just a trade in and of itself that stresses you out when that trade begins to go against you. You you bring back those bad memories of every trade prior to that trade. So it's not that one trade in and of itself. And, and I exploded on my 17-year-old a few weeks back, and I forget what it even was. But she did something. I think it was like, uh, speaking of dogs, she didn't give the dogs water. And to the outsider, you would think I was crazy. But... It's every other time that she failed to do what we asked her to do, including to give the dogs water. So anyway, it's not just that one loss in and of itself. So there is a psychological risk, obviously, when it comes to trading. Now, there is no eternal sunshine, and that's even on awesome positions. And as I've said quite often, George Carlin used to say, when you buy a pet, it's going to end badly. Well, it's going to end badly for this little shit outside. But I don't want to digress too far. <laughs> and my corollary to that is when you make a trade, it's going to end badly. Now, somebody who went through my trading full circle course said, well, maybe I should say uh, when you make a trade, it's not going to end optimally. And I hear you and I hear what you're saying. And I know it's a little bit better way of saying it. But sometimes... You have to be a little bit more blunt to get the point across. So it's going to end badly. So going into a trade, knowing that it's going to end badly helps to kind of get you ready for when, not if, it ends badly. So again, as I've kind of beat the dead horse in this too, but there's one of three things that are going to happen if you're following my methodology and money position management. You're either going to flat out lose like the trade I showed you a couple slides back, or you're going to win a little bit and then give up all of those profits and scratch out, all the remaining profits and scratch out. You'll still win overall in a trade, or you still win all, overall in a trade, but you give up a lot of those gains. And then the best thing in the world that could happen to you, and again, there is no eternal sunshine, eventually ends badly, is that you win, you get that swing trade out, and you start trailing a stop, and then eventually you give up some of the open profits. I think I have another chart on this, and it's actually supposed to be the stop is actually, let's see if I can get it in here. This this looks like you just got a swing trade, but it's this is much longer, and then you get stopped out like way up here, so you got from here to here in the trade. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, one thing that I've actually done complete presentations on is that more often than not, markets will move against you. And then, as I often say, the odds are pretty good right now 
that you're not feeling great about your trades, at least maybe at this particular moment. And a lot of this was based or inspired, I should say, by Robert Frey, who said that you spend 75% of the time in a state of regret or drawdown. Well, think about that. If the majority of the time you are miserable being a doctor or being a lawyer or being an automatic transmission mechanic, you probably wouldn't want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an automatic transmission mechanic for long if the majority of your time you were miserable. Yet in trading, statistically, the market's going to move against you quite a bit. And keep in mind that markets don't move in a straight line. They back and fill quite a bit. And as I've said before, I've had positions on that were doing quite well. But then I watch them intraday and I get bummed out, even though by the end of the day, it's still up tremendously. One of them I thought about when I was writing a column literally on this about a year ago was up about 20%. But then it gave up about... 9% of that move, and it was still up substantially by the end of the day. Had I just made one observation at the end of the day, I'd say, oh, wow, I'm up 15% for the day on this position. That's pretty darn good. But instead, I was watching it as I wrote the column, and I found myself becoming stressed out and bummed out because those profits were eroding. Now, I don't want to digress too far. I know too late. But I think one of the secrets to trading is obviously Pareto principle. You want to figure out what 20% is going to give you 80% of your profits out of those trades. Pick the best, leave the rest. But one of the secrets is making fewer observations and not putting yourself into that so-called state of regret. And as I preach... I keep myself extremely busy, and that keeps me from watching the screen. If I watch a screen, I will make a trade, whether I need to or not. Or I should say, if I watch a screen, I will make an unnecessary trade. I think that maybe I see something developing that isn't quite there. Instead of making that plan ahead of time the night before, I'll just jump in, shoot from the hip, and wing it. I know myself. Now, you always get something good out of Greg Morris. And one thing that he said a while back in one of his presentations is that markets only make new highs 4% of the time. So if you're long, there could be up to a 96% 90 chance that you're in a state of regret because your position is not moving in your favor. Now, I know it's... It can move without making new highs and still be in your favor. But you get the idea. Very little, there's very little time a market spends making new highs. Now, this chart's a little dated, uh, but we're still in an open position. And it's, it's actually done a little bit better since. But based on Greg's statement, I thought it'd be kind of cool to go in and make an indicator that would show me when the market was making new highs and when it wasn't, when it was backing and filling. And the new highs are in green, new closing highs, that is, meaning that if you came in and just checked it at the end of the day, were you making a new equity high in the position or not? And then everything in red, or maroon, I guess, is backing and filling. So you can see it's been very little time in the green, and a whole lot of time in the red, everything in between the green. So, yeah, according to Mr. Frey and according to Mr. Morris, you will be in a state of regret once you decide to take a trade. There's a pretty darn good chance that you will. Even on good trades that make a lot of money. And even though you're making a lot of money, do you find yourself ever get pissed off? Probably. Because you worry about that money eroding. Or you watch that money erode a little bit. Even though it's just a normal ebb and flow or consolidation of the market. 
Now, if you go back to, this is a slightly more updated chart, and this is one we talked about last week, a week before, where we're talking about drawdowns to open profits. So you can see there were substan substantial profits in here, but they were pretty big drawdowns in between. And you can see these are, these are really big numbers, but then draw down fairly hard. Well, that's longer-term trend following. That's the ultimate goal. That's how we get paid. That's how we make the most amount of money. That's what makes it all worthwhile. So even though you've done quite well longer term in this position, there were a lot of times, a lot of points where the drawdowns were fairly severe in that open position. And this kind of dovetails in with one thing I was thinking about. And I field a lot of emails. I don't seem to be fielding as many lately as I used to. And I think that I've got a good core group of people in my trading service now that get it. But one thing I used to get is a lot of emails from people. Hey, Dave, should I exit the trade? Earnings are coming out. Hey, Dave, the stock is down, but the market is up. Something's wrong. Should I exit the trade? Hey, Dave, the stock has gone sideways for a month. Should I exit the trade? Well, just accumulating all these emails, it got me thinking that there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. If a market only makes new highs 4% of the time, then the majority of the time there's going to be a good reason to exit the trade. Now, by exit the trade, I mean abort your plan. 4%, we must have 5 years worth of new highs i don't know what you mean by that when we get to the actual charts we'll take a look at it now again you're going to be wrong a lot but you can still make money and this is a less of course you're a doctor a lawyer or an automatic transmission mechanic if you're killing half your patients in a low risk surgery of course and or if half your bridges fall down then you're not going to be a doctor or an engineer very long, or if half the transmissions you fix break the next day. That's a pretty bad failure rate. But in trading, you could be wrong quite a bit. And one thing that's a little hard to wrap your head around, you know, I was asked last week about mechanical testing. It's like, well, I would encourage you not to waste a lot of time doing it because of curve fitting and all these other problems. But my years of doing it actually taught me a lot about the markets. And one thing that I learned was, and these statistics are pretty solid, believe it or not, as a longer term trend follower, your percent correct is going to be about 22%. Well, let's talk about the flip side of that. Your percent wrong is going to be about 78%. So you're going to be wrong 78% of the time and maybe even round numbers 80% of the time as a longer term trend follower. And the way I've wrapped my head around that and tried to solve for that problem, obviously, is to take the swing trade out and then slowly position into that longer term trader. When somebody says, what's your holding period? I tell them 10 years, hopefully much longer. Any position I get into, I want to be in it forever. Unfortunately, as you know, the money management will often take me out much sooner. But that's the ultimate goal. Now, you can be wrong a lot. And this came from Trading Full Circle. So this was, I think this was, was this last summer? I forget when this chart was done. No, it's earlier this year. And you could see that in the portfolio at that time, two out of three stocks were losing. Okay. And only one stock was making money. That chem we keep coming back to. But notice that the open portfolio, the total profits, is almost entirely in that one position. Well, it is entirely in that one position because the rest were losers. And that's the outlier issue that we often talk about with trend following. Now, there will be emotions and consequences with trading decisions and every other decision in life for that matter. I spent a lot of time teaching and preaching about how trading is not like life. But then one thing that I've been doing in more recent years was also to kind of bring it full circle, so to speak, and show how in a lot of ways it is like life. And that if you can accept it in life, you can accept it in trading. 
So with every decision, as I've said ad nauseum, based on the research of Scholl and Damasio, there's going to be emotions and stress. People without the amygdala portion of their brain where the decisions come from in that midbrain or what's that called? The paleo mammalian brain or whatever it is, the one that right above the, the reptile brain, the little the little the little brain in there. They can't live a normal life because they don't experience emotions and they can't make any decision because they have no emotions involved. So with every with every decision comes emotions and stress. I'm not I'm still drink on the weekends, but I don't drink during the week because I'm trying to lose weight. So it's like the decision whether or not to have a beer after a, a shitty day, it's like, well, I could have the beer. But then I'm going to have to work that beer off and I'm going to throw my throw my diet off. So it's like it's an emotional consequence. And that's just whether or not to have one beer, you know. So every decision has emotions and stress involved. And as I say quite often, with each unnecessary decision comes more and more and more and more decisions. And with each additional decision comes more and more stress and emotions. And then, as you can see, that begins to grow geometrically. Well, what's the solution for that? Well, shit, come back to the plan you trade, trade your plan. You must reduce the amount of decisions that you're making by simply following the original plan. Do nothing unless there is something to do. So with any decision comes emotion. That's biology. But if there's fear in your trading, then you haven't fully accepted the consequences of your decision. Or there's something that we need to know to make better decisions in the first place. So if you go back and look at that career column that I did and go back and watch the week of charts from a few weeks back where we talked about the trading career path, if you truly researched your methodology and played devil's advocate and looked at it through good times and bad times and in, in intermediate, uh, uh, mediocre times, kind of like the Brian Gelber thing where you, you either print money, you lose money, or then you grind it out, and that's the life of a trader. If you fully embrace that, then you're, you should be fine. But if you have fear, then there's something that you might need to know to make better decisions in the first place. So again, garbage in, garbage out. You might have to go back to the books. And again, it comes back also to what I said earlier, a well-executed crappy plan is much better than a poor executed good plan. So once you have reached a point where you could follow your plan, and if things aren't working out, you might only need a minor tweak. And as I said before, without going too far off on a tangent, haha, imagine that. Sometimes I've, I've fixed a lot of people by sometimes just telling them, look, loosen your stops up a little. Their stops are just a little too tight. They're within that normal volatility of the market. And all of a sudden, they start catching big trends. And that's the only one little minor tweak that's necessary. So if you can follow the process, then you can be successful. You just got to work a little bit harder, garbage in, garbage out, work a little bit harder to have better input in the first place. Now, as I said a few weeks back, for those of you who weren't here, there's nothing to fear in the markets. And I'm going to prove that right now. How stressful was the 2016, 2017 bear market in cocoa? Okay, let's look at this. Let's put this in perspective. This commodity lost half of its value round numbers in around a year or so. To those of you who aren't familiar with commodities, that's a pretty big deal when a commodity loses half of its value. That's huge, okay? So how stressful was that market? How many people in here were stressed out? I don't know if I could do a poll or not. <laughs> Donald says he lost no sleep, okay? And why not? Well, he either did one, one or two things. He was a trend follower and followed it lower, or he did not trade the market. He didn't even know there was a bear market in cocoa. 
So there's no inherent fear to a market. That fear is created when that market fails to meet your expectations. I know, it's a lot easier said than done, but I hear you. Now, getting back to the late, great Mark Douglas, and you always get something good out of Mark. And I don't know if it was Trading in the Zone or Dis Disciplined Trader, but I recommend you read both of these books. One day I'll put the list of books back on my website. The website got updated and all the books got wiped out. Amazon shut down my account. Uh, so I need to start from scratch, put that back up. Anyway, Mark Douglas said, what you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. So if there's fear in your trading, maybe go back to the books, find something simple, really simple that you could follow. As I wrote in that career article, find at least 100 examples in good times and bad. Try to find some examples where it just flat out didn't work. Play devil's advocate. And as I also said in the article, when people email me a system, they're not looking for What's, it, what's, it, what's the old saying? When someone asks for advice, they're not looking for advice. They're not looking for an opinion. looking for an accomplice. But people will email me systems that have abysmal drawdowns, and I try to explain to them that, boy, you really got creamed in this thing on paper, of course. And then they're like, no, no, no. By the end of the year, it's actually into profitable. So, all right, fine. Well, would you lose 50 60% of your money and keep on trading? Most people can't do that. All right, Trading Full Circle course is live. It's actually on sale right now. So if you click on the annoying pop down, or whatever they call that thing on my website, it'll be on sale. I gain weight on chocolate. I gain weight on chocolate. <laughs> what does that mean? 4% of 4% must have up five years worth of new highs. All right, let's take a look at the um, let's take a look at the market and in relationship to what Howard is saying. Any uh, any thoughts, questions, complaints so far? So Howard is saying, which I don't understand, four percent. We must have up five years worth of new highs. The Dow has set 58 new record closing highs since the presidential election. 250 days a year, four percent is roughly 10 days or five days worth of new highs. Well, the Dow has set 58 new records in 250 trading days. So 250 trading days, that's what, a year and change or one year? Okay, so it's better than 4%. Well, let's take a look at the Dow. Now, you you did what, what statisticians uh, easy for me to say, statisticians would call, you didn't take a uh, representative sample. So you could see a lot of down days in the Dow in the 20s, okay? It had some up days, a lot of down days here. So, yeah, what you're saying is that we're in a bull market? Absolutely. But go back to 2008 and, and add those stats back in, okay, and see what happened. But, yeah, I hear you. So we're in a bull market. But even in a bull market, I bet the statistics aren't that great as far as new highs. I mean, look from here to here. How many new highs did you make? And, you know, this is where you get in trouble with statistics. What's the old thing, fun with statistics? So you had two years, over two years, where not one new high. So it's 0% new highs over that period, okay? And that's, what's that, a year and a half? A year and a half of no highs. So that's 0%. So be careful that you make sure you're getting a representative sample.
All right, let's take a look at the um, S&P 500, and then we'll take a look at, um, we'll drill down a little bit into some sector action. You guys want to start asking about stocks, uh, do so now. All right, first, let's take a look at these P's. Now, one thing I was thinking come in, coming into the presentation, and as I said in the market in a minute this morning, is when a market is at new highs or near new highs, you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. So back here, you see new highs and then 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 new highs. So you don't want to fight it. Now, when we get to Russell, I'll pull it up. We did have some signals and the market was losing some steam a few weeks back. And that's why I did those winter is coming speeches just to give everybody a heads up. Now, did I go short? Well, I shorted one, but that was only after the market actually turned because I simply liked the setup. I did not put on one short, not that I wasn't keeping an eye out for shorts and not that I would have put on a short, but I didn't find anything that I really liked. Now, if you go back to 2007, there were a lot of shorts that showed up that were worth shorting, and I actually apologized to my clients, as I've said quite a bit, for putting on shorts, even though the market was not too far from new highs because it was beginning to, stocks were getting set up on the short side. And as it lost more and more momentum, more and more stocks set up. This time when it lost momentum, I didn't see that happen. But as a general statement, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but as a general statement, you want to err on the side of longer term trend. And of course, let the database tell you what to do. And if the database is producing a plethora of shorts, and you like them, then start taking some shorts. But as a general statement, you don't want to fight the market when it's at or near new highs. You can dabble a little bit. Don't flip a switch, though, just because you think you might be in a third of a fifth or a fifth of a third or whatever the case may be in your wave count. Or you think the market is going too long at new highs. Yes, it will eventually end badly. But as a trend follower, as I often preach, you're not going to look smart you will have that big drawdown when the trend begins to turn. But that's okay. If a new trend emerges, then you simply go the other way. And if you ever look at if you ever look at what an equity curve might look like for a trend follower, you can take the you can take the trades out of the service if you want. If the market is going up, then the equity curve looks like this. Well the market starts going down where well, the equity curve looks like this. But if the market keeps going down, the equity curve does that because we start shorting and capture the trend. But, yeah, you will be a little late to the game, and you will overstay your welcome a little bit. All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ composite. Now, one thing that's a little concerning with the NASDAQ is – we haven't made new highs with vigor just yet, okay, at least a new closing high. So we've got this little peak back here. This will be an all-time high, and this will be an all-time high here. And we're just kind of barely below these areas, but we haven't busted out with vigor. So I sure would like to see this peak get taken out with vigor. But we're going to err on the side of the longer term trend. Let's take a look at the Russell. Now, this Russell has been in this stupid sideways range for forever, for a year. And it's been really frustrating. But now, especially with yesterday's action, it's beginning to accelerate higher. Now, as I've been saying quite a bit, my only thing or my only concern with the Russell is when you get these V-shaped recoveries at high levels, sometimes it's hard for the market to sustain. And if you think about it, if a market is way up here, a lot of people have already bought. Now, sometimes you get a V-shaped recovery at lows, and those are great. Those are first thrust, bow ties, and some of those other transitional or emerging trend patterns I like to trade. That's a good thing. Well, when it happens at high levels, it's just a little harder to sustain. But a market can do whatever it wants. 
So if we get a few follow through days like this, then I'll start getting pretty excited about the Russell 2000, especially on a lot of follow through followed by pullbacks. Now, one thing that's always amazing, and you just have to accept it as how markets work, but it always amazes me and markets off to the races where everybody in the brother has their own stocks and the next day it's like, eh, a bit of a shoulder shrug. And so far, we got a little inside day working in a Russell where, you know, at the end of the day, it might be one of those, after all was said and done, a lot more was said than done type of situations. But so far, so good in the Russell. Take a look at the banks. Banks look quite dubious not too long ago, and I was ready to start shorting them. Luckily, I didn't find any I wanted to short, and maybe that's because we had a lot of support below, and I didn't want to short a market into all this support. But now they made it back to new highs. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet, but on follow through to the upside, it might be worth a shot. Now, it's been pointed out. I saw John Murphy's newsletter. I saw he was talking about the jump in yields is what's pushing the banks and financials higher. And if you pull up the TLT, you can see it's beginning to implode again in here. Not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here. But obviously, rates have jumped. Bonds down, rates up. That's a 100% correlated event. So that's kind of interesting. Take a look at these financials. You can see financials waking up in here today, notwithstanding. But you can see they did break out the brand new highs on a bit of a gap. This is the XLF. I like looking at this one better than whatever the Morningstar group is, because the Morningstar has a bunch of uh, ETFs in there, which aren't necessarily correlated. All right, what else is happening? Energies. Now, I haven't been a huge fan of energies this year just because they've been kind of, well, they drifted lower for a long, long time, and then the rally is coming off a of high levels. So I prefer these low-level type of rallies. But if you look within the energies, I'm trying to think of, is it CRC or one of these? Yeah, it might be CRC. Stocks like this coming off of low levels could set up soon and might be worthwhile. So that's what I'm watching for in the energy. So let's take a look at the metals. Metals are stalling out a little bit in here, as you can see, dropping lower. Some of the metals have been kind of hanging in there. Let's take a look at the, um, the actual gold itself. This is a gold commodity. And you can see that it's kind of wide and loose. Yeah, it's improved as of late. But I wouldn't be that excited about buying gold at this juncture. Gold and any commodity for that matter, I'm more excited about trying to buy it when it's making a transition off of lows. I'm not trying to pick a bottom, but I want to wait for that bow tie or some sort of transitional pattern off the major lows. As opposed, as I was saying earlier, to trying to buy something when it's at mid-levels like this. Now, if it does break out to brand new highs for the year or over 2000, if it gets over 2016 highs, then on pullbacks, it might be worth a shot. Quite a few areas at or near new highs, manufacturing back to new highs, kind of that V-shaped recovery. So keep an eye out for that. Some areas pull back a little bit like the semis, but they could use a pullback. Let me just pull up Apple. I pointed out to my peeps a couple days ago, Apple set up as a bow tie. That's a short. I don't come egg my house. I know you people won't because you're traders, but Apple's one of those Wall Street darlings where one day it will end badly there. That I can guarantee. But this is a little bit concerning. I think the – I don't know what it is now. If somebody wants to Google it, um, Phil, if you're still here, he's usually pretty good at finding these things out. The Apple is like a ridiculous amount of the NASDAQ 100. Percentage-wise, it, it, I think it got as high as 30% a while back or 26%, something like that. And then it they scaled it back, and then the stock grew. It became bigger and bigger. So if you think about it, if Apple begins to sell up hard, it's going to take that big that index down with it and could take more indexes down with it. So not that the market can't rally without Apple, but that would be a negative development. You can almost kind of look at Apple as an index in and of itself because it's such a big cap stock. So that's something that we might want to keep an eye on. 
Uh, these insurance stocks, I sure thought they were rolling over, but then they seem to have a, another life to them. They're pushing back towards new highs. Craig's pointing out that the yields are helping the insurance companies. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. All right, let's uh, – transports. Let's take a look at transports real quick, and then we'll open up for individual stocks. Transports doing pretty good, just shy of these all-time highs in here, so that's certainly a good thing. I'm not a Dow theorist, but I do add in the fact that – or do – uh, measure what the transports are doing, and that becomes part of the puzzle to figure out the overall market. So it's a good thing when the transports go the same direction as the market. As the market, um, semiconductors. I'd much rather watch the semiconductors as they relate to the overall market as opposed to something like the transports. But they are a watch, so they're worth watching. Energies. A lot of bow ties have been taking place. Yeah, a lot of bow ties are for major lows, so that's why I'm liking those. Uh, Stocks. Uh, Donald's talking about a gold stock. That's in the land your list, Donald, so we can't talk about that one today. I know Apple's in there, but I don't think anybody's going to rush out and short Apple right now, so that's why it's okay to talk about that one. All right, John's been wait waiting patiently for Vera, V-E-R-I. Yeah, this is one of those buy it, B type of situations uh, in an IPO. Um, let's talk about a new position first. I think it's too crazy now for a new position. It's ran up what... Uh, how many percent over 600 percent, 700 percent over a short period of time. So I would pass on this, and it's got an HV of 153. Um, I would call it more of a bottle rocket. Remember earlier I said the shorts like to short the parabolics? That's a parabolic, okay? Now, one thing that's kind of cool in this stock, if you put in the five-day moving average, remember when we were talking about that? Dave Light, I think is what somebody called it, which was uh, nice. I call it Daylight. And you only buy when the IPO makes a new high and there's Daylight, which would have gotten you in. Let me zoom this in a little bit. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> Craig, I might have to hire you right here. Because the low must be greater than the moving average and it must close at a new high. And that's it. That's the whole system in and of itself. I mean, how beautiful is that? And as I, I keep going back to that article, I, was, I guess because it's fresh in my head, but the new me, the old me, back when I was doing all that mechanical testing, was how many how many oscillators could I add in to the system and how complex could it make it? And now it's kind of like the new me is like, what's the simplest thing that I could ever explain to you on a cocktail napkin, Okay. And that's like the low has to be greater than five-day moving average, and it must close at a new high, buy on the close. That's the whole that's the whole system right there. So that would have been your setup right there. Buy at B would have gotten you in a little bit earlier on that one. But, yeah, pass as far as the new setups on that one is concerned. SQM, a lot of picks today. Good, good job, guys and girls. We've got a crowded room. Fantastic. Yeah, I like this one. I think that's on the Landry list, too. Um, there might be something that's that's a little bit lower levels that that might be worthwhile. I mean, this thing's been in a pretty long trend, but I can't argue with that from a from a trend following perspective. V E R I, poor John. He waited for an hour, and then he had to go back to work or wherever he did. Go back to his family. Go beat a dog. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Rata. Well, my problem here is it broke out, made new highs. That's not the problem, but it then it came back down below its prior highs. If you're long, stay long, obviously, until you get stopped out. But I prefer stocks that don't pull back to the prior highs, unless some in some cases, it, unless an IB, IPO or something, I might make an exception. A buzz. This is what I've been watching. It's kind of crazy though, and it's run higher, and it's a little on the thin side. It's a fairly extreme move higher, so I would wait for a fairly deep pullback. On that one, this is not enough pullback. I'd like to see a pretty deep pullback on that one. I think that's on the list today, though. Is that where you're getting it? Sometimes I put stuff like that on a watch list. Keep an eye on it. 
make sure it doesn't slip through my fingers. Uh, yeah, this is kind of interesting. As I've said before, with IPOs, sometimes they die and then they fly. In this case, this was a fly, die, fly. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. You know, maybe on a pullback, my only concern here is you had this, you didn't have this much, Is one big update. It didn't really accelerate much from that update. Let me show you what I mean here. See this update here? It just kind of drifted higher from that. And it only closed a little bit higher. And then it tried to take off again. So I don't know. I think I'd pass. I hear you. And it definitely has some momentum to it. But most of that momentum was just in this one big up day. Maybe I'm too much of a perfectionist on that. Yeah, Donald, that's – Donald, get off my landry list. That's on the landry list too. <laughs> Sound like an old man. Hey, you kids, get out of my yard. Quat. Quad looks like another one of those upward drift things. Notice I've got a drawing in from last week. Notice how it took off and then it went through an upward drift. I mean, it doesn't look horrible. You could certainly do much worse. I can't beat you up for asking me about a stock that's trending as a trend follower. But you can see that it's decelerated in its trend. So I'd find something that's accelerating in the trend. CVE. Yeah, this looks really good. Um, you've got a lot of um, overhead supply to deal with. I know it's a ways away, but I'd, I'd like to see if I could find something cleaner. You know, a lot of what I do is playing a game. And right now, I think the game in the in, in, ugh, in the energies is, is this. Let's see if we could find ones that have these Phoenix capabilities. Let's see if we could find some that will came from... Super duper high levels, bottomed out, maybe cup and handle, bow tie, whatever, and have the potential to go back to their old highs. And even if they, I sound like the guy in the, in the silver commercials, even if it only goes back to half of his old time highs, you'll still make 200%. So, but even if it does only go back to half of its all time highs, you'll still do pretty good. What I would try to avoid is those with a big wad of overhead supply in between. And that might be hard to find. S and D for James. Yeah, this is um. This looks kind of interesting. This is again, this is the fly, and the die, and then is it time to fly again, with the IPO thing? So yeah, this looks interesting. Um, not much acceleration off the low, but it is kind of bow tie e. It looks okay. It looks like something that has bottomed out and could make. I'd like to see a little more acceleration, maybe, but it looks okay. You could certainly do much worse than that. ARWR. That sounds like a pirate stock. Arr. Yeah, it's making new highs. It looks good. This is on my momentum list, but um, it's not set up yet. It would have to set up to. Uh, to pull back, Let's see if I can find it in here. BLDP, let's say ballot power. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe in a little bit of a pullback. I mean, it's kind of crazy longer term. It's kind of volatile, volatile, but maybe in a little bit more of a knockout. I mean, you can't argue with the fact that it's definitely taken off, but if it begins to look like that, maybe pulls back to at least four, it might be worth a shot. RDC. Jerry, you're next. Yeah, now here's something that's bottoming out. Doesn't have a whole lot of bad memories. The bad memories, there's trading, there's trading past the bad memories. I mean, you could argue that maybe people didn't get out. But at least you've got some trading in between the overhead supply. Does that make sense? See, go back in time until you hit trading. Okay, you got trading there, and that's mostly been kind of a downtrend. And this wad of overhead supply is way back here, and it's kind of it may have likely or it likely has washed its way through the system. 
So, yeah, but on this particular one now, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. Just marginal new highs. Uh, so we talked about TLT. TLT, uh, I'm not a big fan of trading something like TLT because it's big and thick. But shorter term, obviously, it's in a downtrend. We had the gap down a couple days ago. And it looks like it's in trouble, at least shorter term. But intermediate term, it's pretty much sideways, okay? And then, yeah, it looks like it could return to its old lows, but that wouldn't be a huge opportunity shorting bonds at this juncture. I don't think it would be that great. You know, maybe in a longer term portfolio, if you shorted them and put a stop in at 130 and just sat on them forever. RDC, did we talk about that one? Yeah, we did. Jerry, next, QNST. Yeah, put this in your momentum list. I've got it in my momentum list. Um, it's a little on the thin side, though, so be careful there. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. I mean, this is a nice persistent uptrend. and It has acceleration. Remember earlier in the presentation, I, I didn't know whether I was making myself clear when I was talking about some of these stocks that have decelerated. In other words, they've taken off, and then they've done this. But notice this one has taken off and then accelerated. So, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. I'd be all over that. It is, again, a little bit on the thin side, so be careful. Zag on a pullback? Probably. Zag's on my watch list, too. The only problem with Zag is it's really made a pretty serious move longer term. But, yeah, on a pullback, I mean, it still could be – it's still fairly early in the general, schemes of thing, general scheme of things. So, yeah, next pullback, Zag, absolutely. Um, my – I want to stop. Let me uh, change my internet here. Well, I guess I'll leave it on. NE is going to be an energy stock. Just bear me one second. I need to change. Let me just change my internet connection. And that concludes the secret of trading. <laughs> My problem with Jillian is that it it took off and then it went sideways. Then now it's coming back in. Okay. So, yeah, it's still in a trend. And, yeah, it might have a long ways to go in that trend. And maybe I'm looking for too much perfection. But it just... The majority of that move was kind of like a one bar of wonder, and now we're almost back to that one bar of wonder, okay? So I would pass on that for now. TLRA for the other Don. We got so many Dons in here. It's the funniest thing ever. Um, now, I know it's way back in 2014, but obviously it does have some overhead supply way back there. Sometimes markets could have long memories. I don't know. Maybe if it followed through to the upside and pulled back. I mean, it certainly was a persistent trend not long ago. Scott wants to know about Tau. That's an airline, right? No, education. Never mind. Well, it's definitely in a longer-term trend. As a trend follower on a pullback, my only issue is that it really didn't take out this high with much vigor. So maybe on a pullback, I could reevaluate it, but I think ideally you want to see this bang out some brand new highs and then follow a pullback. I wouldn't mind finding uh, stocks. My keyboard's finally giving out on me. I wouldn't mind finding stocks in, in a little bit less mature trends. Don't you hate people to say mature? It hasn't matured yet. UUP is going to be the dollar. I've been watching the currencies lately. I'm short the uh, – what am I short? Let me check. See, this is that's a sign of a true technical trader doesn't know what his, what his positions are. I am short the euro versus the British pound. And that was off an hourly bow tie, I think. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Now, keep in mind, you'd be much better trading off the – you'd be much better trading the actual currencies – uh, currencies are a lot more efficient markets, so you got to pick your spots carefully. In fact, I can't right now. I can't find a setup that I want to trade, and that's been weeks. 
So I'm just sitting on this short euro versus the pound position for now. Um, but I hear you. I like what you're doing. I like the fact that you're looking at something coming off a major low, especially when it comes to a commodity or a currency. And that's what I that's exactly what I do. And then you could have a bow tie here. So good eye on that one. Uh, who gave me that? I already forgot. Jillian on your list. Yeah, we just talked about Jillian. EWZ is going to be a foreign uh, ETF. It's going to be the Brazil. And it looks pretty good. Got to be careful trading the Brazil ETF. You might get waxed. Um, does have some bad memories way back here. Maybe that's far enough back to not worry. It did take out these prior peaks, but now it's pulling back to them. It looks okay. It looks okay. I think you could probably find – I'd rather trade an individual issue right now. There's an ETF. The ETF you mentioned earlier uh, looks a lot better than that, okay? I guess I can mention what it is. The ETF would be lit, and we'll take a look at that. Don was asking about. Yeah, this looks pretty good. It's got okay volume, low price stock, on a pullback maybe. You know, and that's the type of energy stock I'd be interested in. Something that's coming off of lows. Look at the bow tie in here. Look how textbook that is. Good job. Who gave me that one? Jim Freeman. Good job, Jim. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. I'd be all over that. Now, lower price, speculative, fairly low volume given the price of the stock, also high HV, so consider yourself warned, but I think it'd be worth a shot. I really do. High five on that one on a pullback. <laughs> Brazil, ETF might get waxed. Ha <laughs> ha, good one. Do you do much shorting this? No, we're short. Uh, no, I haven't shorted much. Uh, we're short PGR in the service, and so far it, is, has, it has failed miserably. Um, but I'm not giving up on it just yet because we're following the plan, right? But you can see it, it has a bit of a gatekeeper look to it. If you want to rush out and short it, please do. Put your best clients in it on the short side. <laughs> but no, it's a general statement. No, and that was my point earlier. Uh, I forgot to show you in the Russell. Even when the Russell was beginning to bow tie down back here, which I guess more appropriately or accurately back here, uh, we just didn't see a whole lot of shorts. Now, we would have taken them if we'd have liked them, but we just didn't see them. So we let the day to day speak. And the, the point I was trying to make, and hopefully I didn't talk out of both sides of my mouth, but the point I was trying to make was that you want to listen to the database and don't flip a switch, your bull bear switch, and go crazy bullish or crazy bearish. When you see something like this happen, don't go crazy bullish when you see the market rolling over a little bit, but do honor your stops on existing positions and do pay attention for new shorts. OK, as a trend follower, again, you're going to be a, you're going to be a little late to get in. So you have to be patient in that. So, yeah, that's the only short EMES for arsony. Yes. Yeah. Or as we say in Fargo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll probably see this one on the service tonight. Uh, nope, wait a minute. Mm. Well, I'd prefer, I'd have to give it a little more analysis. I'd prefer if it was coming off of all-time lows, but that does look pretty good. I mean, if that was all-time lows, you'd get a high five right now, but you're close to a high five. Look at that, bow tie. See, I, and I've been telling everybody, this is where we're looking for opportunities. We're looking for opportunities in these energies at low levels that have been beaten up. Kind of Phoenix type of thing. But, yeah, that's pretty good looking stock. I mean, I could pick it apart a little bit if I start working on it. And this is why it might not be an official setup tonight because it does have quite a bit of overhead resistance. But that's a ways away. It might be worth a shot. So, yeah, I like that one. And whatever that other energy was, I'll, I'll find them all tonight in my analysis. Okay, this is trending nicely. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, possibly. Uh, let's see if we've got any bad memories. It does have some bad memories, but that's way back in 2015. Let's just see what happens. Let's, you know, it's like Justice. What's his name? Potter Stewart. I'll know it when I see it. But if it could continue to accelerate higher like it's doing now, maybe a few more up bars followed by a pullback. Absolutely. WTI is going to be an energy stock. What's or used to be? Let's see. No, yeah, WTI offshore. 
yeah, look at that, just kind of straight up. Not quite off all-time lows, but close enough for government work. Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Like I said, I'm going to be all over these energies really soon. I'm getting pretty excited about them. Finally, something to look at, huh? S-I-E-N. And actually like a little bit deeper pullback. But yeah, it's trending. Um, it's got some bad memories way back here. But yeah, put that on your watch list. JBHT is going to be a trucking company. Um, longer term, I find this stock kind of wide and loose. I find trucking stocks tend to be a little wide and loose. But shorter term, I hear you. It's broken out to brand new highs. Maybe on a pullback. I think there might be some areas with slightly bigger opportunities, though, because notice the HV is only 17. But I'm not going to argue with anyone who shows me a stock that's trending. So, ESV, we talk about that. ESV, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Coming off of lows. Howard says, my biggest winner in a while, AKCA, mine too. Yeah, this was one that I got in on a buy at B. And then it subsequently, uh, and it's not too late. Everybody should buy it. <laughs> you should buy as much as you could afford. You should cash your kid's college fund out and buy as much of this as you could afford. Absolutely. Yeah. No, please don't. That's, that's me being silly. One, two, three, four, five. Your buy would have been right here on the Dave Light IPO system. OK, which you could actually get out of that career column that I talked about. I've been talking about. And then, of course, if you want to get the IPO course, you could do that. Shoot me an email. I'll give you a promo code. I'll make you a screaming deal on that. For those of you who don't have it. Look, one trade would have uh, made up all that. But, yeah, nice, uh, nice work on that one. CLMT, that's a crazy one. Too many days in the pullback now. Back the chart out a little bit. Uh, but I hear you. It looks like a major bottom's in place on that one, huh? Yeah, if you're long, stay long. But uh, too many days of the pullback for me to go after it for an established issue. Sometimes on an IPO is one we're looking at now that has quite a few days. ABEO, did we talk about that one? Yeah, I think we talked about that one. It's trending. Putting it trend, put in your list. It's not set up. Kind of crazy longer term, but I hear you, shorter term. Uh, Donald, that one's on the watch list for today, so you win. <laughs> See, you did all that hard work. You could have just followed along. You didn't have to do all that hard work. I'll do the work for you. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. It's got a lot of overhead supply, but so what? I guess if it got up, when it, well... Yeah, I think I'd pass based on the overhead supply. Then that sounds crazy. Like, Dave, if it got up there, it'd be, what, 40% move or something? Well, actually, the other way would be 40%. But um, I think I would pass. I mean, maybe a swing trade if it pulled back a little bit, a little, little bounce in here. You could certainly do much worse. But I think I'm going to pass based on the overhead supply. There's a couple other ones like we looked at earlier um, that look pretty good. And then I'll probably be all over tonight. You'll probably see an energy or two in the uh, – in the service, depending on how the day shakes out. Yeah, this looks interesting, but it's already breaking out to brand new highs. So if you're not already long, then uh, let's just now you would have to wait for follow through to the upside, followed by a pullback. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the one we're talking about, I think, Howard. Is it ESV? Or one of these. My keyboard's just crapping out on me. I really abuse my keyboards. Yeah, ESB V maybe on a pullback. It's got some bad memories to it, but a lot of that again is behind its trading. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, definitely what I would do is I would tool through all the energies tonight that are tradable, which I have been doing lately, looking for setups. And I'm based on today's action, looks like we might just uh, find something. All right, we're almost out of time. Any last request? Got about two minutes. While we're at impasse, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate you being here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, davidavelander.com. 
A uh, couple announcements. Again, Trading Full Circle is 50% off right now. And um, the reason I've got that for 10 days or nine days now is because there are some people that are still watching the videos, the initial four videos. So if you still want to watch those initial videos for free, uh, there's a link on my website for that. Uh, click on the little, uh, it's like second down from the top. And that'll still give you time to watch the videos one day at a time. If you're interested in the IPO service, shoot me IPO. I'm sorry, I don't have an IPO service. I have an IPO course. Shoot me an email and I'll give you a promo code on that. So you can get that buy a B and other stuff. All right, again, uh, if we don't talk again between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys and girls showing up. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Jill, Russ, Don.